This is the Breaker.News podcast for the week of January 22nd, 2023. I'm Bob Mackin, publisher of the Breaker.News and host of the Breaker.News podcast. Welcome to edition number 274, and happy Lunar New Year. Xing Yang Quiler and Gung Hai Fa Choi. The Breaker is your source for news, opinion, and analysis about British Columbia issues, institutions, and influencers. Later, I'll tell you how you can support The Breaker. On this edition, headlines from the Pacific Rim and the Pacific Northwest. I award a virtual Nanaimo bar to a difference maker. And the big deal feature. Catching up with Kennedy Stewart, the former mayor of Vancouver is back to work as a political science professor at Simon Fraser University. He reflects on his term in office and looks ahead. And remembering Gino Ogic, hear from Jeff Sandus, who reported on the late Canucks fan favorite's career back in the 1990s. This is the Big Deal feature on the Breaker.News podcast. Kennedy Stewart is back, at Simon Fraser University, that is. Three months after losing the mayoralty to Ken Sim of ABC Vancouver, Kennedy Stewart made news on two fronts last week. He has resumed his career as a political science professor with a new title, Director of the Center for Public Policy Research. He is also finishing a manuscript for a book about his time as mayor. It's called Decrim, How We Decriminalized Drugs in British Columbia. Douglas and McIntyre will publish the book this spring. Here are excerpts from my interview with former Vancouver Mayor Kennedy Stewart. You know, after after election night, uh, really just started talking with SFU about uh, coming back and what, what would happen there. So that, that took a little while to arrange, but also just... Uh, the next week, <laughs> contacted uh, Douglas and McIntyre and asked them if they were interested in a book on decrim, which is happening this month, and they said yes. So then, a lot of my time has just spent uh, been working on the book, and you know, elections are <laughs> really busy times, and so just catching up with friends and family over the holidays, and uh, yeah, but that that's pr- pretty low key, and uh, yeah, and it was uh, nice to just catch my breath after such a busy time in my life. Will the book also just tell the story of your mayoralty too? It'll be a little bit of that. I mean, it's hard to disentangle the two because they're they're so uh, connected. There will be, and also, um, you know, spending seven years in Ottawa, there was some, also the players there. So, um, you know, it, it really, it's not an academic book. Like, it's not going to go through and, and have uh, um, tons of, peer-reviewed research it's more the story of of how this all came to be because when I came into office in 2018 I was told over and over again uh, directly by the prime minister twice by many by many um, senior ministers uh, you know both at the provincial and federal level that decriminalization was never going to happen <laughs> so so that we ended up uh, getting it and then you know, I, I think the form that it came in hasn't pleased everybody. So I think explaining uh, just the compromises that had to, to be made to, to get this done is that's what the book's about. And it really is a, hopefully a, a bit of a you know an insider's lesson for uh, others who want to make tough policy changes as to how you might go about it. And when it came to the campaign, um, was there anything that you wish you could uh, you know, go back in time and do differently? No, I don't think so. I mean, um, for me, you know, if I think back to 2018 when when I was elected, it was pretty clear that I'm an activist mayor. I mean, I was arrested <laughs> trying to stop a pipeline six months before I took over the mayor's position. So people knew what they were getting is a, a very uh, progressive mayor. And so, you know, the, the shingle that I hung out in both elections um, – was exactly that, you know, that I was going to do everything I could on the drug issue, uh, try to push transit forward, uh, especially uh, the, the SkyTrain to UBC, uh, the extension, uh, and to build as much housing as possible. Um, so that that's really the shingle I laid out in 2018. And when I look back, I think, well, you know, there's there's really three broad groups of voters in the city. There's there's left wing voters. There's a, a cent- center. I could either go left or right, and then there's a right-wing component, and that's been through the history of the city, and 
in the first election in 2018, you know, I got about 50,000 votes. That would be the left kind of progressive part of the city. And, and Shano Sylvester and Ken Sim kind of split, uh, split the center center right vote more or less. And so in the 2022 election, there was no split in the center center right. And so, um, you know, the platform that I ran on in 2018, uh, which is who I am as a person, and and also in the 2022 election, uh, you know, the left way, uh, the 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 center center right kind of came together. I think to uh, you know to take control. Mm-hmm. So I wouldn't change anything. I mean, I believe in what I believe in, and and I think had a good record of success on those items. Like I, I really secured over a billion dollars in social housing investment in the city, and. We got uh, decriminalization and got good transit investments and, um, um, you know, did things like address, push to address systemic racism within police. Uh, but that is not, those issues are not top of mind for center center right voters. My guest is former Vancouver Mayor Kennedy Stewart, political science professor at Simon Fraser University. Of course, the pandemic intervened and yeah, caused everyone yeah. to, to have to change course uh, in every way, shape it possible. Yeah. yeah. And that, uh, that kind of is, I think, I think a lot of people in politics who have been through that, um, I look at many of my municipal colleagues who are no longer in office, like they either left or they lost. And that's, um, you know, the pandemic took an especially hard toll on municipal leaders, uh, I think. And uh, you're seeing that. And I know that that was a worry uh, for many provincial and federal leaders who were saying, oh, boy, this is going to hit our cities really hard. And, and Public safety did become an issue, and and there was enough evidence there that was showing that there was something wrong. It's it, it's it's politics, so so your opponents are going to try to hang everything on you. Uh, if you look at the at, at what mayors can do about this, it's it's about pushing. We can't alter the police act. We can't change the how the court systems work. But um, you know, my opponents tag me with that uh, fairly or unfairly, and. Um, you know, what's remarkable is um, the city is exactly the same as it was, you know, on October 15th. It's exactly the same as it was on the uh, October 16th. But you don't um, really get this. You're not seeing the same level of of kind of outcry about this. And that, that to me, shows you, you know, how, how much of that was uh, just part of a political campaign. Um, you know, we've had a couple more police officers hired, perhaps, and some more money put into policing or even though the, well, the city hasn't passed their budget yet, so we don't know how much they'll be putting in. But, um, you know, for me, it was a campaign and the police joined in happily to, uh, you know, to attack a progressive mayor. And that, uh, and so now they've got their wish. They have a, you know, a center right mayor who's wants to be tough on crime and, you know, we'll see how that works. And all evidence shows that that, that approach won't, won't do anything, but, um, I guess time will tell. It was no secret that Kennedy Stewart wanted to forge closer ties between Vancouver and Taiwan. But before the election, federal intelligence agents warned Kennedy Stewart that the Chinese Communist Party could interfere in the Vancouver election. I asked Kennedy Stewart if that made a difference. Um, you know, I, I know that the, at the federal level, they're, they're looking into uh, election interference. Uh, and um, I welcome that. I, it's it's really hard to determine whether or not that happened. We did pick up on the ground uh, through the campaign a couple of instances where that may have been the case, um, but it's 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 hard to prove that. And then you think, well, how much energy do you have to do that after a campaign? So I, I do think that it is up to uh, you know CSIS and and you know BPD and and the national government to try to keep our democracy whole and I would hope they would continue with those efforts and, and make them public if they if and when they become known um, but uh, for me I'll always uh, land on the side of democracy if I I am very worried about the Taiwan situation I I think you know you look what happens between what's happening in Ukraine now and how that affects both local people and the, the world economy I, I think we have we have a, a high risk of that happening uh, in Taiwan as well, and um, I think you have to be on the right side of this one and, and and stand up for for democracies that are under threat. And so, 
you know, I'll continue to do that, to, uh, whatever path I, I uh, follow for the, for the rest of my career. And, and if it costs me in the election, that's okay, because, you know, you have to stand up for what's right. Do you think you'll leave the door open to a possible uh, run for public office again, or uh, was that enough for you that you've you, you, enough uh, to to be in public office and also enough uh, enough fodder for more books and more classes? <laughs> well, for me, I mean, I did run. My first time I ran was two thousand four. Um, I ran with Jack Layton in Vancouver Center and uh, lost that one, but had a really good, uh, really good experience. Um, and then I, I didn't. Uh, you know, run again until 2011. So there was quite a long gap. And what I've learned over the years is is that you really have to have a window to walk through. And, and right now, I don't see, uh, uh, you know, there's there's not a window that's open for me, and that's fine. There may never be another window that's open for me. But uh, you know, you always you always keep your eye open. But I, I'm just really excited to be back at SFU, and 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 really grateful uh, for you know to go back to uh, such a good. Uh, you know, school public policy is a great place to, to teach and to, to learn, and, and so I'm you know excited about going back. But you'll, I'll be active on, on various political issues like drug policy reform, and and um, but whether it means I sit in another elected chair, I'm not sure. But uh, you know, I never thought it would happen in the first place anyway. So <laughs> you just kind of you just kind of take life as, as it comes. That was former Vancouver Mayor Kennedy Stewart, now the director of the Center for Public Policy Research at Simon Fraser University. He is also the author of the upcoming book, Decrim, How We Decriminalized Drugs in British Columbia. Vancouver lost a hockey legend on January 15th, Gino Ogic. The 52-year-old Algonquin from Quebec spent a dozen years in the National Hockey League with the Vancouver Canucks, New York Islanders, Philadelphia Flyers, and Montreal Canadiens. Eight of those years were in Vancouver, where he became a fan favorite, enforcer, and line mate of the Russian rocket, Pavel Bure. After his career, he settled in Vancouver and worked at the Musqueam Golf Course. Ojek suffered from a rare disorder called amyloidosis and died of a heart attack. Here is a clip of Gino Ojek from a spring 2022 interview with Megan Augusta, courtesy of Canucks.com. So my last question to you is, uh, do you have a message for Canuck fans who have shown so much support for you throughout the years? Well, thank you and keep supporting the team. I know, uh, you know, sometimes we had, it's it's not going as quick as you want, but uh, the Stanley Cup's gonna come to Vancouver and thank you for supporting me and supporting the team every year. Yeah, no, that's awesome. One of the many with fond memories of Gino is Jeff Sandus, who was a classmate of mine from the Langara Journalism School, class of 1990. Jeff covered the Canucks as a reporter for United Press International back in the 1990s. He now freelances for the Epoch Times. Remind me of what it was like the first time you saw Gino Ogic play. He, so he came up in 1990, and at that time, the Vancouver Canucks... They lost most of their games, but what was worse, at least from the fan standpoint, is teams would come into the Pacific Coliseum, and after they would beat them, they would kick sand in their face. And they had some game players that would do their best to stick up for guys, um, but you know they just weren't in the category which most of the teams had. So when there was Gino Ojik's introduction – a lot of the fans that night were hoping to see him fight and hoped that he would actually be, yeah, like a, like successful. And, you know, like he had a wrestling match with Dave Manson in the second period. And Manson was a pretty good hockey player, but he was a huge guy who also could fight. But it was uh, at the end of the game where Ojek had a fight with Stu Grimson, who was one of the premier fighters, uh, at least established guys in the NHL, uh, that the fans left that game feeling like finally there's somebody here who is going to stick up for us. That's all we all talked about uh, up in the press box uh, the next day with you know our friends and our colleagues. Uh, it seemed to generate a lot of enthusiasm and he, yeah, he was in a good division to kind of build on that 
that if I can say skill, there were a lot of really tough guys in the Smythe division back then. I think it was the Smythe. And they would have to play like uh, the Oilers and the Jets. And, you know, I think they played them eight times a year. And so you would see the same guys over and over again. And back then there was honor among fighters. So if you challenge somebody that you would have to fight and a guy like Dave Brown, who was one of the premier fighters back then, basically let Ojek fight him once or twice every single time they played. And, you know, he, uh, he definitely was able to build his reputation up. Uh, he was always a personality on the ice. So when he would have a, anything that would be noteworthy, whether he would score, whether he would fight, whether he would get a cheer for a body check or something, you could see this innocence and, and loving charm that just seemed to kind of come with him. And really Vancouver fans, I think, uh, adored him for just that kind of, he was a boy playing a man's game and he really, you know, showed the enthusiasm that came with playing it for fun. And I would also argue too, once Pavel Burry came along, they became really good friends. Uh, that I think helped endear him to the fans. Uh, not only was he protecting the other players, but, you know, Burry became the biggest commodity on the team. And, and with their close relationship, I think a lot of fans sort of uh, really appreciated that too. I'm speaking to Jeff Sandus about the life and times of Gino Ogic. And here he was uh, paired with uh, the Russian Rocket, uh, two people that uh, came from completely different backgrounds, completely different styles of hockey, but were part of the same team under Pat Quinn, a team that eventually became uh, a winner and came that close to winning the Stanley Cup. Yeah, that was 1994 that you're talking about. And I think that might have been the year that uh, I think Ojek had a career high in goals and points as well. He... Yeah, in between him and Tiger Williams, there was quite a gap. Uh, they had had some other guys uh, sort of fill that enforcer role along the way. Glenn Cochran, Dave Richter, uh, Craig Cox. Uh, but nobody really captured the fans in that regard like Ojik seemed to. His timing to come up was just really good for him and what the city was looking for. So... Yeah, I mean, him and Pavel had, you know, they had a life outside of hockey with each other. They they were playing on a line for quite a while together. They were, it just seemed to really enthuse. Yeah, the, the city just really embraced them as a pair. And you know what? When you would see Ojik in the dressing room, he was very approachable. And just like you see on the ice when he would get all giddy after scoring a goal or you know, just doing something that would generate some cheers. He was like that there too. He's just very simple. Uh, he loved playing the game. He loved scoring. And really at that time, the, the guys who fought tended to have, uh, the fans really embraced them. And Ojik just kind of took it a step further. And it, it's tragic that he ended up getting uh, a disease that really, impacted his life in the latter years but his uh even i was reading too bob uh the new york post put out uh a pretty nice column because he was traded to the new york islanders after he left the canucks and uh they talked about him being a fan favorite there as well so he carried that image with him as he moved away from vancouver and overall i'm sure he looked back uh you know, on his career with some fondness. And of course he was part of the Canucks alumni for a lot of years up here too. Uh, in fact, I saw him this, this summer at a golf tournament and uh, kind of relived when I said, Hey brother, I was there for your first game. And we just kind of talked a bit about that and how I had the good fortune of covering him and getting to know him back then. But he represented the Canucks very well, uh, both in uniform and uh, in the alumni. And what was he like uh, back then to interview? And what was he like also to meet in social situations like when you met him last summer? Like, I remember there was a guy named Steve Smith, very good player. He would go and have a shower for 45 minutes, so he would not have to talk to the press. But Ojik wasn't like that. Uh, not every game would people come and talk to him, but there's always at least one or two that wanted to, you know, get his thoughts or just chat with him. 
he's like uh the guy you invite over to you know to have a beer and watch the hockey game with he was like that in the dressing room and he just seemed to really appreciate life he didn't he didn't have his he didn't look down on anybody he he was just a regular guy uh, and he was the same way when I got to see him again uh, this past summer. He was starting conversation. He knew he was representing the Canucks. And he was obviously in discomfort, if not pain. Uh, he's all swollen his feet and his legs. And and yet he, uh, he, he made time for everybody that wanted to talk to him. And because he's one of the more iconic Canucks that are part of the alumni, everybody wants to talk to him. So he made that time available for them. So yeah, I, I, I guess the Canucks had um, a moment of silence for him and recognized him last night. And it's, it was well-deserved. He is definitely somebody who made an impact on the team. And of course went to the Stanley cup with them in 94. And that probably also helped, you know, generate some of the, yeah, just the history. He, he was able to, you know, form as part of a, a longtime Canuck. And I believe, yeah, he was also inducted into the BC Hall of Fame. Uh, yeah, he's he was he was a great guy to talk to. Ultimately, what what do you think his his legacy will be? When we followed him back when he was on the team, it, it's a lot easier to sort of see the charm and what he contributed in an era that's been abandoned now. So it's harder to appreciate. And, you know, you're talking about, you know, his sort of uh, the troubles that he had afterward. He confessed that basically his last few years, because I think he was two years in Montreal when he retired and a couple of years in Philadelphia, but he said he couldn't even remember how to get to the arena. He, he was just in a daze from too many concussions. So... I mean, that's, that's one of the pitfalls of, uh, I guess his job and not having a proper medical community to recognize the, the hazards or the dangers regarded to that. I think for people that were around during the nineties and his legacy here in Vancouver, they'll remember him fondly, but outside of that, Bob, I, I don't think he's probably going to have much of a blip on the Canucks radar. And you know what, if the Canucks wanted to, they could, they, um, they could probably every year have a fundraiser for uh, that condition. He had amyliosis or I can't, I don't know how to pronounce it, but um, that, you know, that might be a way to kind of keep Gino and his memory alive. That was Jeff Sandus who covered the Vancouver Canucks in the 1990s for United Press International and followed the career of the late Gino Ogic. The Canucks are planning to celebrate Gino Ogic's life on March 2nd during the annual Aboriginal night at Rogers arena. News podcast for Around the Rim. We look at news headlines around the Pacific Rim. In the Taiwan news, Taiwan ranked third safest country in the world. Walking alone during day and night both rated very high for safety. Taiwan ranked very low risk for home invasions, theft, muggings, robberies, and car theft. Under Nemeo's safety index, Taiwan came in third place with a score of 83.8, trailing only Qatar and second place United Arab Emirates. Fourth place was the Isle of Man, followed by Oman, Hong Kong, Armenia, Japan, Switzerland, and Bahrain. In Kyoto News, Japan eyes leaders' visit to Hiroshima Shrine during G7 Summit. Japan is planning a trip to an island known for its UNESCO World Heritage Shrine for the group of seven leaders during their summit talks in May in Hiroshima. Meanwhile, there are security concerns, as the leaders of the G7 states, Britain, Canada, France, Germany, Italy, Japan, and the United States, plus the European Union, would need to travel to the island by ship or helicopter. In Hong Kong Free Press, Hong Kong Customs smash 6 billion Hong Kong dollar money laundering syndicate, highest on record. It was revealed that the syndicate members had opened a number of personal and company bank accounts in various local banks to deal with large amounts of money with unknown sources between 2020 and 2022, Customs said on Wednesday. Nine people were arrested. They could face up to 14 years in jail if convicted. Six billion Hong Kong dollars is worth more than one billion dollars Canadian. 
that's around the rim on this edition of the Breaker.News podcast. Now it's time on the Breaker.News podcast for Cascadia Calling. We look at news headlines around the Pacific Northwest. In the Oregonian, audit. Oregon's drug decriminalization measure 110 shows $33 million in grants drew scant evidence of effectiveness. Setbacks and delays hindered the rollout after Oregon voted in 2020 to decriminalize drug possession for personal use and increase funding for treatment services. That's the message from Oregon Secretary of State Shemaya Fagan, who released an audit Thursday of the $150 million per year initiative funded mostly with cannabis tax revenue. Oregon has the second highest rate of substance use disorder in the United States and is 50th in the nation for treatment access. In the Seattle Times, stung. Sting reportedly played elite Microsoft event as layoffs loomed. On the eve of Wednesday's announcement of 10,000 layoffs, the Redmond-based tech giant hosted Rockstar Sting at an intimate event with top Microsoft execs at Davos, the swanky yearly shindig for global bigwigs in Switzerland, according to the Wall Street Journal. The message in a bottle was, you're fired, read one tweet. In Czech news, University of Victoria cheer squad soars to world championship win. The 24-woman cheer squad is undefeated in BC since 2017, a hot streak any Vikes team would love to have. The team traveled to the ICU University World Cheer Championships in Orlando, Florida, and also won the Nations Cup, awarded to the highest scoring squad out of all 15 from across the globe. That's Cascadia calling on this edition of the Breaker.News podcast. Virtual Nanaimo Bar, brought to you by Spruce Hill Contracting. Every week we end the Breaker.News podcast on a tasty note by awarding the goodness of a virtual Nanaimo Bar to people making a difference. A virtual version of the province's favorite dessert bar goes this week to Miners of BC. January 22nd to 28th is Mineral Exploration Week in BC. You can nominate someone for a virtual Nanaimo Bar. Send me an email to bob at thebreaker.news. Spruce Hill Contracting, custom homes and renovations. Find more information at sprucehill.ca. That's it for the Breaker.News podcast for the week of January 22nd, 2023. I'm Bob Mackin. Thanks for joining me. Did you know that on the 22nd of January in 1906, an estimated 140 people died when the steamship Valencia sank off Vancouver Island near Cape Beale? It is one of the worst shipwrecks in British Columbia history. Now you know. Send me your feedback. Send me your story ideas to bob at thebreaker.news. Bookmark thebreaker.news. You can also find us at thebreaker.ca. Sign up for the email newsletter and get updates to your inbox. For news as it happens, follow The Breaker News on Twitter and visit TheBreaker.News on Facebook. You can support The Breaker for as little as $2 a month. For more information, go to Patreon.com slash TheBreakerNews. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash TheBreakerNews. And happy Year of the Rabbit.